Father, we thank you. We thank you because you are great. And we uh, gladly will say we are not so that we can be joined in through your son Jesus to your family. Oh, Father, hearing us sing, I just want to echo Darren that it is a beautiful sound to hear your people sing praises to your name. Father, it's my desire here this morning that everything we talk about, everything we do, all that we discuss will make much of your son, Jesus. So, Father, whatever we walk through, whatever burdens we carried in here with us, I pray that we just lay it down. We let you work. You remind us in our hearts of your goodness, of your purpose of everything that you're doing. And I pray for the families who have been hurting this week, for those who have walked through difficult seasons. I pray that you just whisper to them right now that you love them, that you are there and very much aware. And Father, we just trust in all that you do and all that you are. And we ask this boldly in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Kids can be dismissed to go to their places. I don't know if some of you did walk in through the new entrance, but it is finally finished and will be fully functional here soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm so, I can't tell you how thankful I am um, for that to be done. <laughs> so so yeah, so I, everyone who, who uh, gave towards that, everyone who helped us walk through that, everyone who gave advice and direction and um, uh, helped me in my low spots and uh, Thank you. Thank you for all that. Um, but uh, we, we are excited about that. I, I just want to say um, before we uh, dive in, man, that, that song that Darren just sang, it's a song that, uh, um, uh, man, a good friend of mine, a uh, mentor of mine uh, would sing all, all the time. And I loved hearing him sing. I loved participating in worship with him. And uh, he passed away, you know, a little over a year ago. But it's, it's ironic because last, uh, um, the past couple of days, um, uh, his... Uh, one of his other guys that was he was mentoring and myself we got to uh, who lives in Pittsburgh. Okay, I knew there would at least be someone who said it. Go Steelers. Uh, he lived in uh, <clears throat> Pittsburgh and uh, he came. Th- <laughs> okay, that w- once is enough. Uh, and he came came through and um, going to Indiana and he stopped and we hung out for for several several hours just talking about life, Jesus, ministry. He's a pastor over there, and so when pastors get together, they usually talk about all the good things that are going on. <laughs> you didn't believe me? Okay, so uh, yeah, we just, uh, um, and, and it's so encouraging for my soul, because listen, I don't know, uh, I don't know how you operate, uh, but I want to be in the space, I want to be in the room um, with, with minds that are just absolutely brilliant, and his is, like, like to be able to um, uh, talk with him, and scriptures just kind of just naturally just come out. We're able to discuss things. I, mean, I never even thought of it that way. Like it's just so uplifting for for me. And so he came through, and we got together and and hung out for several hours. And he made it over there. And then uh, he texted me on his way back yesterday. He's like, "Hey, man, it is exactly halfway." I'm like, "Please again." Uh, and so he came, and we hung out, and and this time we we talked. Um, Talked about our beloved John, who, uh, man, when you when you talk about crying out for someone to be rescued and healed, uh, physically healed, uh, man, there was there was countless people that were that were doing that for this man, and uh, and it was time for him to go home, and so it was a tough thing, but but it, it does um, kind of stir in my heart this morning because of the text that we are going to be in. As you know, we have been discussing talking about. Um, scriptures that are taken out of context. And so the one that we're going to be talking about here this morning is one that um, uh, I, I just, I just want, to, I want to lay some, some groundwork. One, you may not believe me, all right? Uh, we, we may have differing opinions on the, the scripture I'm going to bring to the table. My point this morning is to actually give it some more context than maybe what it's normally used in. And so that's what I want to do. But, but I, I will caution, 
uh, us this morning that if you feel your blood boiling a little bit like I don't like where you're going, here's my encouragement to us all is that when we um, maybe don't like what's being talked about, we'll naturally go deeper into God's word to figure out where we land or if we do like what's going on, we'll naturally go deeper into God's word to figure out what he's talking to us about. And so my goal and my objective for you is to grow deeper in what it is the Lord has to say to you and for you. And, and listen, I, I'm, let me just lay this challenge out after this week's message. For the next 30 days, don't, don't listen to your favorite podcasts, your favorite preachers, your uh, people that you think line up the most with what you believe. Turn it off and spend the next 30 days just reading scriptures and see what the Lord does. Because we live in a world today that's so inundated with social media and YouTube and podcasts and everything telling you what to believe. Maybe for a moment, just pause and say, God, can you speak to me louder than what they have been speaking to me? It, 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 I just think it would be a, a neat little thing to do. But, but, but either way, you, you can you know, do homework or not. Do homework or not. Um, so in... Florida, um, perspective is everything. I don't, I don't know if you know that, but when we were in uh, Florida uh, and I was a youth pastor um, down there, what ended up happening uh, is we took a group of teens to this Chris Tomlin concert. Anyone remember Chris Tomlin? Okay, we just sang a song. That, yeah, so we took it to their uh, uh, How to, How Great Is Our God tour and then the Indescribable tour. And so we went to Palm Beach and the um, where we went, like it was like 40,000 people there just praising Jesus. It was the most miraculous, beautiful thing I've ever been a part of. Like just seeing and hearing so many people, it was almost like we got to hear just a little bit of what was going on in heaven in that moment. And it was amazing. And and the, the teens, man, they they loved it and were so excited and they left there on fire for Jesus like literally they were like hey Jeremy can we go back to the church and go to uh, uh, the, the rest of the night because it was Saturday night uh, into Sunday morning can we go back to the church and just read through the Psalms together no your parents won't like that right like I don't know only we can do that but they're like no can, can we please let's just let's just spend the rest of the night reading through the Psalms I'm like you're teenagers on a Saturday night. I'm sure you don't want to do that. No, we do. And I kid you not, there's at least 15, 20 of them that wanted to just stay overnight at the church to read the Psalms. Talk about an encounter with the Lord. I'm like, well, we can't do that, but here's what I will do. If you guys want to get up at 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, I'll meet you back here. We'll have coffee and donuts, and we'll start reading through the Psalms. And what ends up happening is those teenagers got up at 6 o'clock in the morning. They came back to church, and we sat around the table and we just started at Psalm 1, and each one of us just read through one, and we talked about what it meant and how it resonated with our soul. It was a beautiful thing. But what was crazy is uh, at the end of that, that night before we, we did that, or the, the, I'm sorry, the second time we went to one, we had the same experience. People just loved what was going on, and we're walking back to the car. And I was a couple of teenage boys that were picking on each other, and now all of a sudden uh, they got into a fight. I'm like, were you not here last time? Like, what, what happened? Like, what changed? You guys were so mesmerized by Jesus last time that you fell deeply in love with him. Now this time, all you're thinking about is your own selfish needs and desires. And what's interesting to me is that oftentimes when we read scriptures, we, we read it from maybe a selfish perspective. That maybe we read it from a perspective that we want to make sense. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read it like I've done every time, is I'm going to read the verse, and then we're going to talk about it, and then I'm going to read some context into it and then be done. It shouldn't take us real long. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Here it is. This is the main one. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you are straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and to the overseer of your souls. 
Now, 1 Peter, Peter right here, writing this down, is actually quoting from Isaiah 53, which we will uh, go to uh, later. But the topic at hand, the statement at hand is, by his wounds you have been healed. And the issue, the reason why this has been taken out of context is that immediately most people, especially in the Word of Faith movement, believe that what this is telling you and I is that because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you and I have been physically healed. And now, now here's, here's the issue. What I did this week, because I, I told Scott I was going to do this, I was like, um, I wanted to listen to sermons from, from both sides. Because if you haven't figured this out, there's always like two sides, and I wanted to listen to both of them. So I'm, I'm driving from uh, prison to prison, and I'm turning on these sermons, listening to what's going on. And this, the, this particular uh, pastor, this one word of faith movement, meaning that God is for your health and prosperity. And so I'm listening to it, trying to listen to it, what he's saying, and then all, all of a sudden, this is, this is what he says to me. Not to me, personally. Like, anyways, this is what he says. He says, um, the fruit that we've seen in our ministry, we've seen healings all over the place, like more healings than you can even imagine, all kinds of healings. And, 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 and until, until you and your ministry get the fruit that we have, you should probably listen to me. Verbatim, this is what he said. I'm like, Next. Um, because I don't, I don't believe that primarily Jesus went to the cross so that we could be physically healed here, primarily. I believe Jesus went to the cross primarily to glorify God, secondarily to rescue humanity, right? And we've already talked about that when we went through John. That when Jesus' time was up, he was going to go to the cross to glorify God, to glorify uh, the perfect plan that God had already set in place. And in glorifying him, he rescued you and I back to God. So those who put their faith and trust in Jesus now have restoration. We have a home. We have a righteousness that we can never earn on our own. And that was what he did. Um, but in this text, what's happened is people have taken it and made it to be about Simply physical healings. Or, well, here, here's what I'll do. I'm going to give you my kind of seven issues with that. And then we're going to do some context, and then uh, I'll read Isaiah 53. Here's the flaws. Number one is this. Healing, the word of faith movement, is almost always interconnected with prosperity. Which, okay, when you read through most of the New Testament, that would probably come to a surprise to people like Peter, to people like John, who was banished to an island, his eyes plucked out and lived there for the remainder of his lives. It would be difficult for someone like Peter who was crucified upside down because he didn't believe he was worthy enough to be crucified right side up. So you would start to say, okay, wait, wait a second. Is it really health and prosperity? Because the rest of the New Testament seems to talk a lot about difficulties and trials and sufferings and things that don't always go the way we want them to go. Number two, healing seems to be very selected in its outpouring, conduit, and recipient. Meaning, you just got to get to the right place. Get to the right ministry. Get to the right movement. And your healing will come. But if you don't get to the right place in the right movement, then get to the right person, the right conduit, the person who actually can have the power to heal you. So get to that person. And, and if you can't get to that person, then you just need to have enough faith to believe that that healing has already manifested itself. And so as long as you have enough faith, you'll have it. The same message that I listened to said this, that one person got healed in their service, believed in the healing, was healed when they walked out, but stopped believing when they got to the car so they got sick again. So my healing physically is dependent on my faith? That's a scary place to be, which we'll, we'll talk about. Number three, the invitation to salvation through Jesus is all-inclusive, yet the manifestation of healing seems to be very exclusive. In um, two thousand and when was it, 2006, I was in a church service where we got the news that a family from our church just gave birth to a baby prematurely. 
and this baby was in the NICU. Um, and I've never seen a group of people crying out for the Lord with such fervency and passion as we did those next several days. Saturday night service, we got together in, in this church. They did kind of this altar call. Everyone from the church was forward. Everyone was on the ground. Everyone was crying out, praying that God would rescue, redeem, sustain this little girl. We were praying fervently. The parents, in faith, believed their child would continue to live on. And then six days later, she drew her last breath here on earth, but her first breath in heaven. And it was one of the hardest moments to walk through because you start to ask the question, why? If it, if it had to do with the amount of faith and the posture and the position, man, we were there. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a moment that you just wanted God to do something and you couldn't, like you just were praying that he would do something. Anyone? And all of a sudden, maybe it was a, a friend, a loved one, and, and it didn't pan out the way that you wanted it to pan out. You're like, why, why is this? And, and the word of faith moving, the ones who want to take this scripture and said, by his wounds you have been healed, so you need to believe that you're already healed. So just trust in that, believe in that, and your healing will manifest itself. Well, the problem is, what if it doesn't work? Is it, is it my fault? Is it because of my lack of faith? Because I'm going to be honest if my healing is that dependent on my faith, my faith in my everyday walk with Jesus sometimes struggles. I, I need to know that my anchor to the Lord is something stronger than me. So I'm thankful, as we've already talked about, that my anchor to, to the Lord is through Jesus. Because I'm going to have seasons in my life where my faith is fluctuating Number four is this, the healing is oftentimes works-based, which becomes very precarious. Try harder, believe more, trust more. Believe harder. <laughs> Number five, focusing on physical healing is one-dimensional. In fact, it's a new thought through the uh, Greco-Roman Empire into the westernized Christianity. This would not have been the original Jewish thought that the healing discussed in this moment was simply our physical healing. There's so much more to that. And, and once again, as I'm sitting there talking to my, my buddy Josh uh, just the other day, we're wrestling through this passage and his understanding of the Jewish mind and Jewish thought it blows me away. And he starts describing these things of how kind of holistic and more robust the Jewish would have thought of this passage. It wasn't simply a physical healing. It was literally me being restored back to my original purpose with God himself, and it was full and beautiful, and we've reduced it down to just here and now. There's so much more to that. Number six, physical healing was not Jesus' primary objective. Uh, that sometimes if you read through the Gospels, you're like, I don't, I don't, Jeremy, he did a lot of healing, which you're right. But you ever wonder what the person next to the guy who got healed felt like? The lame who was healed at the pool of Bethesda, when there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people who were physically struggling. And the record only shows that Jesus healed that person. Um, if, if healing was Jesus' primary focus, then, then I think we may have had more of a record of that. But it almost seems like what the healings were doing in the Gospels and in Acts was simply uh, authenticating Jesus' mission as the Messiah that's stated in Isaiah. So in Isaiah, it said that when the Messiah comes, the lame will walk. The blind will see and the deaf will hear. And it was a prophetic statement of this is what to look for when the Messiah comes. So the Messiah comes. Jesus shows up on the scene. So what happens is that he fulfills that prophecy that happened years and years and years before that. So he fulfills that and it just authenticates his ministry that this is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for. So you watch him do these things. But what captivated the hearts of humanity was when he spoke. 
And when Jesus stood before Pilate and said, this is the purpose, this is why I came, that those would know the truth. And when they hear my voice, they will know the truth. Like, that's the reason he came. And in fact, if I was to say it this way, um, after the book of Acts, even the word heal or healing drops off the page drastically, which is interesting. Do you ever wonder if the primary mission for Jesus, for the gospel, for him going to the cross, was for our physical healing? We wouldn't have Paul saying, I've prayed three times for this thorn to be removed. And you didn't answer. But you said, your grace is sufficient in my weakness. Maybe there's something more to the struggles you and I go through than just trying to be healed from it. I wonder if healing was primary. We wouldn't even have that text from, from Paul. Number seven, uh, which I kind of already included, but physical healing is rarely mentioned after Acts. If our physical healing was primary, then Paul, John, Peter would have mentioned it especially if it was rooted in our salvation or in the work that Jesus did at the cross. Paul, who writes some of the most beautiful um, kind of this is what it looks like. You were dead in your sins, and now you've been made alive together with Christ. Like You would think that some of the language of now believe in your manifested healing would take place in there, but, but it doesn't because there's so much more going on. And before I go on any more tangents. I want you to see, start with me in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start above uh, in, in verse 22. This is what it says. He, Jesus, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten or continue entrusting himself to him who judges just, justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were strained like sheep and now have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your soul. What's interesting in this context is that Peter is connecting the suffering that Jesus walked through, through the suffering that um, the Christians that Peter's writing to are feeling and having to endure. Because in verse 20, for what, um, what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. A gracious thing in the sight of God is to walk through or to endure difficulty, strife, and suffering. It sounds a little counterproductive to then later believing that by his wounds you have been healed means uh, healings and prosperity. All I'm here to say is if you live life long enough and you pursue Jesus fervently enough, what ends up happening is that one who lives a godly life will be persecuted. There is something that happens. Either in your own families, there are people who will go a different direction. Like, I, don't, I don't believe in what you believe, and there'll be some friction there. Maybe your school, maybe your work, maybe you finally fell in love with Jesus, and in doing so, what happens is the friends you once had are no longer there. But for you and I, what tends to happen is that we, we strive for it for a little bit. We face a little bit of resistance. We face a little bit of difficulty, a little suffering, and instead of enduring, we just go back to what we know. Because it's comfortable and easy. And what Peter's saying here is, listen, Jesus didn't turn around. He continued. He moved forward in his own suffering. He went to the cross. For us, as we live this life and feel even some of this suffering, we are comforted in the fact that Jesus suffered so that you and I can have righteousness and that you and I who are straying like sheep will now return to our shepherd so that you and I who are um, wounded by sin can now be restored. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Isaiah 53 so we can go back to the original 
text. Um, as you turn there, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a definition for what I think the Bible just like talks about when it comes to healing. To be healed biblically in this context is a complete restoration of a wayward people and mind, heart, and placement back to God. That when healing is mentioned in Isaiah, when healing is mentioned later, what we see, in fact, through all of the prophets, that it's God, when he says, I am going to heal my people, it's almost always because they are now wayward. They are now in affliction. They are now away from where they should be, and God's healing is more robust, bringing them back in. And I know Isaiah 53 is typically only done right before Easter, um, but I think it will be good for us. Let's start in verse 4. This is what it says. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. You see, it's very, I mean, Peter just stole it, plagiarized it from here. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, everything going on in this passage, this suffering servant defined in uh, Isaiah 53, what Jesus will go through means that when he was scourged, when he was placed on the cross, he took our unrighteousness, all of it. And if we could just go back to what we talked about last week in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, that he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. What's going on in this moment is that Jesus is going to pay for the sins of humanity. Back in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, it broke everything. Absolutely everything. No one gets through life unscathed by the repercussions that happened back in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible would tell you and I that our sin is not a lifestyle, but it is a position. It is innate. It starts from the inside of us. And if you need any kind of evidence, try parenting. Do you have to teach kids to do bad things? No. Don't touch that. What are they going to do? They're going to touch it. And I say, I told you so, right? Unless you're a nurturing parent. I don't know. Uh, but either way, like, you don't, you don't have to teach a two-year-old how to throw a temper tantrum when he's denied a candy bar in Walmart. You don't have to teach that. That's a natural thing. So what happens is that you and I are born broken because of sin. We are born with an incurable disease and an infection that you and I don't have the remedy for. And so when Isaiah gets to 53 here and God's telling him to pin this down, he's showing you and I what the remedy is going to be because of the infection humanity has because of sin. And the only remedy is Jesus. And in this moment, what he will endure for our healing is displayed here in 53. That the totality of my healing and your healing is found in the perfect work of Christ. Here is what his scourging, his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave has earned for you and I. Now, just a quick sidebar. Um, I, know, I know it's easy for me to say things about the Word of Faith movement that I disagree with, but let me tell you this. 100% believe that God still heals people. 100%. I, I will have people, if you want to come forward and you need prayer for healing, we'll pray for you. We will lay our hands on you and we'll pray that God will heal you. I believe it. I believe it. 100%. However, 
a healed person with a lost soul. It's not good. But a rescued soul with a failing body will exchange that body for one that will never fail for eternity. Okay, so, so, so I, I just want to say in, in perspective that I, I believe it, one, but I'm not going to tell you that your healing is dependent on your ability to believe it. What I will tell you is that believe in the one who paid it all for you, Jesus. And when you struggle at believing, he will allure you to the wilderness and speak tenderly to you to remind you that it's in his obedience that secures you and I to the Father. This is what happens. I, I will stand on that. But let me give you, I gave you seven things the other side. Let me give you these seven things. This is what I believe when you look at, by his wounds we are healed. Here's what happens. The first one, the incurable infection of sin curse that separated humanity from God is now remedied. Uh, listen, there is no other remedy. Once you find yourself in a spot in life where you believe that there is a God, the next question has to be, now how do I get right relationship with him? And the answer to that is Jesus. Always and solely Jesus, the only one that can cure the infection of sin's curse is Jesus. Now, anyone ever find themselves doing dumb things still? Oh, he didn't even raise your hand. You just laughed about it? Okay, I appreciate it. No, not me. Like, like we, still, we still struggle with these things. Like, there's still some of that, although the infection has been cured, there's still this tug of war in the heart that pulls um, me in one direction and in another. We still have a residue, if I may, that we constantly have to depend on Jesus and his spirit to deal with. Number two, that what this healing encompasses is the spiritual deadness of our hearts and minds are now made alive. Like you feel differently. And when I say feel, I, I don't mean emotions. I mean like you, you see someone hurting and it just, it just causes you to hurt because you know Jesus spent his time with the least lost and lowly. And so when you see the least lost and lowly, there's something within you like it does the heart of God. It kind of causes you to bend towards them because that's what happens. You've been given a heart of flesh that aligns with the heart of God and you feel that. And then your minds are opened. You see things differently. Like when you read through Scripture, your mind is not veiled. You see what is going on. You understand that the things that we're going to wrestle against are not just flesh and blood. That there are things going on around us that we need to depend on His Spirit to deal with. Like you, your eyes are opened. Your minds are open. Your hearts are open. Number three. It cures us of the disease of self-righteousness and self-reliance. The cross reminds you and I we can't do it. It outs us. Unless you know there's no other way for this to happen. Like You cannot do it yourself. There is no self-righteousness that's worthy enough, and you cannot be self-reliant. The interesting thing about Christianity is it's someone who is starting to become more dependent instead of independent. It's someone who decides to cling closely to the Lord, not drift away. Number four, this healing involves the curing of our insatiable love for creation or sin instead of the creator. That because of sin, what happens is that we started to fix our eyes on creation instead of the creator, and part of the healing process is God getting our attention back on him instead of on his creation in a, a trivial way. I see some Browns jerseys out there, some Steelers ones, some OSU ones. Like, isn't it interesting? Not to call you out up front. No. <laughs> You're proud. Uh, isn't it interesting, though, like, we, we naturally um, propagate things that we love. And what happens in the realignment of our hearts to God's is that 
when we, when we finally have our heart realigned with him, we will naturally propagate his love, his purpose, and his mission because it lines up with how he has now rewired us. He changes our desires, longings for creation and puts it back on him as the creator. Number five, our constant and innate need for self-indulgence and self-seeking is taken care of. The uh, United States, as beautiful and amazing as it is to live here, the Christianity here looks a lot different than in other places of the world. The things that we are concerned about, the things that we wrestle with, are so much different because we're so easily distracted. And all that needs to happen is something to placate to our need for self-indulgence in certain areas. And we find ourselves, and I don't know if you've ever been here, but you're walking with the Lord for a season. All of a sudden, you just take a quick left turn, and you find yourself in a season of your own mess that you know you need rescued out of. It's because we are so distracted in this day to pull our attention from Jesus to other things. We go from being a wandering orphan to a beloved child. So this healing process isn't simply the infection, isn't simply our uh, spiritual deadness. This healing process is God bringing us back into his family. It's a complete restoration that you, as a wandering orphan, now becomes a beloved child. Seven, go from a place of uneasiness and chaos to home and to rest. I remember... uh, going into Pastor John's office when I was a youth pastor in Florida. And I was reading this text, and I walked in, and I said, it seems like what I'm supposed to do is to convince teenagers that sin is less important and less beautiful than finding rest in God. The text we were in in Hebrews is talking about these fleeting pleasures of sin, and we know that sin uh, is pleasurable for a while. We get that. So so now I have to stand before teenagers and say, listen, listen, the sin that so entangles you, the sin that so entices you, all of this, the sin that is pleasurable, that right, right there is less to be desired than finding rest in God. You know how hard that is? To, to convince teenagers that? And then I realize, you know how hard that is to convince adults that? That finding rest, complete, total rest in the Lord, is so much more satisfying than the pleasures and ramifications of sin. But this healing process, Jesus being scourged and put on a tree, for you and I, was to bring rest. Meaning there's peace between me and God. I mean, I don't have to try to prove anything anymore. He's not going to love me anymore. He's not going to love me any less. Like, there is a rest that's found, a complete, total rest that's found in the hands of the Creator. Number eight, last one here. This, and by his wounds we are healed, is also talking about the final exchange of our earthly failing. Anyone know your body's failing? Anyone? Amen. Okay, come here. Our earthly failing bodies for a glorious, never ending, eternal body. As, as Darren makes his way forward, um, I'm going to read this again and, and, and then just share my last few thoughts and be, be done. And I want you to feel the weight of this passage of Isaiah 53. Allow it to speak to you, maybe just deeper than, than normal. I'm going to start in verse 3. He was, Jesus, despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and was esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed, he was crushed, he was crushed for our iniquities. Meaning the sufferings, the difficulties that we deal with here liken us to the sufferings and the difficulties he walked through to rescue you and I. Man, I don't, I don't want to see people die of cancer anymore. I was having a conversation last night talking about this, and someone asked me, he's like, so how, does it ever get hard to come up with new things to share? I was like, well, usually it's just hard to find illustrations uh, to share because I feel like I use the same ones over and over again. So she's talking, she's like, what do you mean by illustrations? So I start to, to share some things, and she's like, oh, wow, like for the text that you're in this morning, let me, let me tell you about this. And she starts to share a story with me about um, a friend of hers who is wrestling right now with a child that is currently right now in the NICU. She lost her first one at 22 weeks, adopted two, got pregnant again, and gave birth early to her second, and is struggling for her life. But then when you read through the post, like, there's these comments, these, like, dedications of the Lord, you are our, our strength. We trust in your ways. And I'm sitting here thinking, why, why another child? Like, why do people have to wrestle? Why, why, why does it seem so selective? Anyone ever ask that question? Why is this family going through everything under the sun? And like this family over here, it just seems like things are great. Like, it's, it's that moment where if what this was about with health, health and prosperity we would eventually be exhausted and frustrated. But what this is about is that when you do walk through suffering, when you do have struggles, when there is something that comes your way, it's a reminder that this isn't the end because Jesus went to the cross to secure for you and I eternity and he suffered and he endured and he was scourged and he went to the cross so that you and I can have the righteousness. So for the little time here on earth that we're struggling, that we're enduring, it will be an end and at that end as Jesus Christ bursts through the tomb so you and I will resurrect and be with him forever. And there will then be no pain. There will be a total healing. And eternity is a whole lot longer than 80 years. Because to me it would be a travesty if your entire life you trusted, believed in God so that you would have your healing and you get healed yet you still die five years later, 10 years later, 98, whatever it may be. Like there's more to it. And that is no matter the affliction you and I go through here now, there will be a reprieve, there will be an end, and it will be with Jesus forever. Because upon him was a chastisement that brought peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We have rest. We have been cured. We have righteousness. Everything is encompassed by that word. For we all like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon the iniquity, or upon him, the iniquity of us all. If you do this for a moment, just close your eyes. As we conclude, um, I, I want to do two things. I want you to wrestle with the text that we've dealt with, what you've heard, what you've been through. But, but I also want you to know that if there's a place to go when you want reprieve, when you're struggling and suffering when you have an ailment that you want God to to take care of like this is still the time and the place pray that God would deliver you can continue to do that please do spend time in this moment trusting in the perfect unfolding will of the father through his son Jesus in your life maybe for some what you'll hear is a gentle whisper of continue endure maybe some of you will just hear do you know that I love you whatever you're walking through you know I love you because I think sometimes we think that we walk through some of the things we're walking through because God's upset with us 
And maybe in this moment, he just wants to remind you that you are loved with whatever you're walking through. Father, we thank you for your text. We thank you for your scriptures. We wrestle with where our faith kind of meets the road. What to say, what to do, how to, how to make this thing work. Father, it's just my desire that we just confess that we're broken people doing the best we can to trust in your ways, to trust in your words, to trust your spirit that we encourage and love one another towards you, that we remind one another that we're not alone, but you are here and then you have put us here to endure and to move forward. So Father, just have a work here in this moment.
your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies. And Father, today as we just come to you, we just want to come to you. And I'm just so reminded, God, that even as an adult, Sometimes I just need to remember to come to you as a kid, as a little child, and just say, Dad, Abba, Father, hold me. Hold those that are around me. Hold those that you lay on my heart to pray for. Hold my brother and sister who are going through that tough season, who need you, who need your strength, need your comfort, and in the midst of of hard times, need your joy need your peace, need your hope. And we know that we, we have that in Christ. We know that we have that, but sometimes that, that, that you want the whole of us. And sometimes our minds and our hearts are not in alignment, not in alignment with you. And we, we need you to put us back right. And we need you to take us by the hand and guide us in that way, in that truth, and in just knowing you deeply, intimately, and that you're in the middle of everything we go through in life. And just as much as we rage and we we cry out against sin, that you are there beside us, waging that war, and and you've won that victory for us through Christ, through the cross. So let that peace, let that hope, let that joy settle upon us in such a way now in the midst of those moments, in the midst of those seasons, but even in, in, in the seasons of the mountaintop, God, may we see a, 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 your vision of how where we are with you, it, it's, it's constant, it's always there, no matter what we go through in life. And ultimately, we're gonna, we're gonna breathe that first breath in heaven where we get to see you face to face, and it's just gonna be so glorious, so wonderful, so beautiful. To God, for everybody here this morning, I, I pray that we have met with you and we have been able to, to hear from you in whatever way you mean, you, you deem necessary, though, whatever way you want to. And, and God is even as we continue this morning, may we continue to hear from you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. And we want to continue uh, in worship and, and, and observing God's tithes and offerings. And as Scott says it every week, this is an act of worship. Right, it's you between you and the Lord, uh, and you going to the Lord and talking with Him and saying, "Hey, God, how how do you want me uh, to utilize what you have already given me, what you've blessed me with, um, in monetary funds and in life, and you know, with the job and everything that we have?" And um, we just want to challenge us too. Sometimes tithing is the sharing of the resources and things that we have in life, right, within the body and within the community. So um, allow. You, God to challenge you in in that as well, but uh, just in case you you don't know the ways that you can give, we do have uh, a box in the back, a box in the lobby where you can drop in your tithes and offering. You can also uh, go online through our website, and there's even text to give, uh, ways that you can give digitally uh, to that as well. So moving forward, October is going to be a busy month. We've got a few different things uh, going on. Uh, I want to let you guys know, starting next week, uh, at the end of the month, we've got Boo Off of Broadway, which is an awesome opportunity to go and be involved in the community, uh, put our stamp there that, hey, we're here, we're Crosslink, we love you. Um, but also, of course, as with Halloween, it's wonderful. You get to give candy out to kids, right? And, and bless their parents with jacked up kids who are high on sugar and just want to eat candy all the time. And you didn't have enough from Arts in the Alley, right? Like I've got two buckets full. My kids ask for candy all the time, um, but they need more. So 
But uh, starting next week, we're going to have a big bucket in the lobby to collect donations for that. Um, there will be a couple, couple people needed for handing it out at the event. I think it's the 29th from like 1 to 4, I think was the time. Don't quote me on that. I'm bad with dates and things sometimes. Um, but uh, that's going on. That's going to be happening uh, coming up. So bring your candy so we can pass that out. Also, in October, October 22nd, we don't have a time for it yet, but the Men's Forge Men's Ministry is going to be meeting for a Stakes and Stogies night or day, whatever time. It depends on Ohio State football. Hey, yeah, Ohio State football. Well, let's just be honest about it. Um, we're waiting on that time, and then we'll kind of coordinate with that. Um, so let you guys know that's going on as well. October 22nd, men. October 22nd, right? Wives, let, let your men know. Also want to make sure you're aware, uh, we've started Linked Up a couple months ago, and uh, today's group started meeting today. It's before service at 9 o'clock over in the Kid City Wing. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to sign up for this month, we do have, of course, it's going to be every month, the first three Sundays of the month, uh, 9 o'clock in the Kid City Wing. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet in the back for November. Um, make sure, and what Linked Up is, that we should let you know that too, right? So uh, just to get to know Crosslink, get to know Pastor Jeremy, know the heartbeat behind our church and what we're going after, uh, it's the opportunity to meet to discuss those things. Um, we want you to go chronologically in order. I should go left to right versus right to left, right? Um, so come to the first one, then come to the second one, then come to the third one. Don't come to the second one and then come catch the next one. On the first one on the next month kind of thing, but go succinctly in order. Um, it'll make more sense when you go through it that way. Um, and, of course, it's just an opportunity to uh, get plugged in. And whether you're a first-time visitor or you've been here for six, seven years, whatever, how long you've been here, we want everybody in the church to go through that so we can all be tied together um, and, and united in that front and that desire to uh, go out and to live out God's mission for cross-link and for the, being within the community, right? All right. And in dismissing, I wanted to say a prayer. Um, Jeremy mentioned Hebrews. Uh, and in the benediction, I wanted to speak that blessing out over you from Hebrews chapter 13. where The writer says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys for being here today. You're dismissed.